introducing the work on internet measurements. We will be speaking both in English and in Spanish. So let me remind you that we have simultaneous interpretation and also remotely. You can ask questions if you come up to the microphone or also remotely in the Q&A box in any of the languages of the conference. I'm one of the chairs, Elisa Peirano, and I work as a data analyst in the R&D department at LACNIC. Let me introduce my co-chair, Massimo Candela. Massimo is a principal engineer at Entity Data. He focuses on research and development of applications to guide decisions and to facilitate day-to-day -day internet operations. He is currently working on the automation and monitoring of Entity Data's global IP network. Okay, let's start. So, good morning, everybody, first of all. Here we are again in another Internet Measurement Working Group session. So, for the uh, people that didn't come to uh, early working group session, so this working group uh, aims at uh, to bridge uh, researchers and network operators in the LACNIC region. We are actually kind of uh, using the same template that is already has been working in RIPE for quite some time. So the idea is to, so what we did is to create a space for operators and researchers to exchange ideas, uh, exchange projects, exchange data, exchange tools, and for a mutual benefit. So researchers provide data-driven insights to shape the internet's future while operators offer practical guidance, share real-world challenges, and help ensure the research addresses operational needs and scalability. Uh, this is a working group uh, in, which is a collaboration between LACNIC and LACNOG. And as I said, it's a kind of recent working group because we did, this is the fourth session that we have, the fourth edition. Uh, we had three before this and we had one buff but let's exclude the buff. Let's focus only on the past three sessions. And um, since the working group is a effort for the community, for you, I think it's important to share with you uh, numbers uh, about how the working group is going, statistics uh, on essentially, uh, uh, I mean, the, that what we are getting out of for transparency. And also the, the numbers that I'm going to show you, they are quite good, so I'm, we are proud to, to show it to you as well. So the first uh, uh, number that we have is that when we do a call for presentation, uh, we had on average in the past three uh, uh, session, we had a 42% accent rate. So this means that we do a call for presentation, we receive a good amount of presentations, and then we have to value them. Number one is the quality uh, of the research, and number two is uh, if it's going to be interesting for you. Uh, so 58% uh, we have to not accept it, maybe we propose them changes for next time, uh, but anyway, it's healthy to, to select uh, based on quality. Um, the institution they usually uh, present, they are 50% uh, universities, but that is normal because we, there is a lot of research in this working group, but we have also 33.3 from industry, so IXPs, IXP, uh, ISP, so operators in general, and 16.7% from uh, not profit, so it's a healthy balance. If you look at the content type, uh, we have a 65% of uh, peer-reviewed material, which uh, is also a great uh, uh, value. So this means that, in general, the presentation that gets accepted here, they, have, uh, they are coming from journals that they have been, like IEEE journals or ACM journals or PAM uh, IMC conferences. So we have, so they are basically material that has been already reviewed by committee of expert in the field, so also this is something that uh, help us to give you high quality. And we have to interact a lot with research uh, organization for doing this. Pres uh, the language mostly is Spanish, a bit more than English, actually it's almost 50-50. And the origin of the institution is 365 
North America and South America. They both have the same uh, share, the same amount, and 25% of presenters are from Europe. And we discovered one kind of fun fact while we were doing these numbers is that despite the fact that the institutions is uh, 30, uh, it's basically between, as you can see, between North America and South America, we have uh, a lot of presenters that uh, they are originally from South America. So this means that there are a lot of presenters that actually are from South America, but they work in a North American organization. So this is a quickly, we wanted to give you these numbers just to give you uh, to, for, for transparency on how the working group is, is going and what we are doing and what type of, of content we produce for you. But let's go straight to the agenda. Uh, we have uh, four presenters today. Uh, the first presenter is Esteban Carissimo. He will present uh, a decade of crisis in Venezuela, a view from the perspective of the internet infrastructure. Then we will have Cecilia Testart. She will present barriers to RPKI adoption. Uh, then we have Amrish Fukia. Uh, he will present a view of content locality in South America. And uh, Enrique Gonzalez he will present municipal connectivity score based on bulk internet measurement data. And I think we can go directly with the first presenter. He is remote. First presenter is Esteban Carissimo. Dr. Carissimo is a postdoctoral researcher at Northwestern University. His research work focuses on critical internet infrastructure. He is currently working on study of submarine cables criticality, content delivery networks, and the impact of governments and politics on internet connectivity. So the, Esteban, the stage is yours. The presentation is A Decade of Crisis in Venezuela, a view from the perspective. Bueno, y en la crisis de Venezuela, una perspectiva desde el punto de vista de la estructura, infraestructura. Bien, ¿ven mi pantalla ahora? Sí. Pero no te oímos, ahora no te oímos. Se ve que podemos tener o una cosa o la otra. ¿Ahora? Ahora sí. I was thanking the people of Lucknick and Lucknock for inviting me to participate at this event after so many years, and those of you who were participating remotely, and those of you in Paraguay. Today, I'm going to present a paper that we presented uh, at SICOM. Here you have the original name of the paper. This is a paper that uh, discusses the impact of the Venezuelan crisis on the internet uh, infrastructure, and what our aim uh, with uh, this paper, with our colleagues uh, of Northwestern, is to think of the p possible uh, reconstruction plans for the future future in Venezuela. So for today's presentation, we'll be focusing on Venezuela. I think that I don't have to explain where Venezuela is, but what we want to show of Venezuela is the impact of the crisis in this country and compare it against the rest of the region, of the region and particularly today. We want to uh, uh, see other countries in the region, especially those that have been uh, shared uh, the uh, uh, that have uh, ranked as the first powers in the region. So our work in Venezuela is uh, because of the crisis in uh, the region. You're all familiar with uh, the situation that has implications with many areas of life. This crisis has inspired research in many fields, in the field of uh, public health, energy, or even water management. All, all these uh, works have investigated the impact of the crisis on the quality of life. Our paper is the first to address the deep impact of this crisis on the internet infrastructure in this last decade. And what we want to see and what our paper proposes is uh, a path to recovery. The country has been affected by a long crisis and we need to reconstruct for all the sectors.
I don't know what happened with my camera. Here it's back. Well, I was telling you that no reconstruction plans can be implemented without understanding what the current situation is. But to be able to talk a bit of the results, uh, uh, let me give you some details of the crisis in Venezuela and and specifically the uh, how it has impact uh, uh, the infrastructure of Venezuela is on the largest oil reserves in the world, uh, the conventional oil. And it um, is deeply dependent on the extraction of uh, this uh, resource. And uh, the, uh, oh, sorry, we don't get his voice. Esteban? Esteban, we have a problem with audio. With audio. Could you turn the camera off and just limit yourself to audio? Completely away for a few All right, uh. 30 seconds or something. I don't know if it's a oh, bandwidth okay. issue or something. Feel free to proceed with our camera if um, you believe it's better. OK, let's try it with that. No, we don't have any of the two now. Now we don't hear any. We don't hear anything and we don't see you. Now, yes. Uh, I think. So? With echo, so I guess you are hearing. Yes, we can now hear you, Esteban. All right. Um, thank you. Um, resumiendo brevemente lo que decía. So, uh, summarizing what I just said, the Venezuelan economy is closely liked to oil prices. That's their main income. But ups and downs in oil prices have also led to ups and downs in Venezuelan economy. For instance, if we see the correlation between the price of oil and the per capita income in Venezuela, we see that there are strong ups and downs. There was a big drop of the prices of oil in 1980, so that caused trouble in Venezuela. And in 2014, there was also a, a drop that devastated the economy, and it, they never recovered from that uh, 2014 crisis. So in this context of the Venezuelan crisis, we want to see the impact of the crisis in the infrastructure of the Internet. We use several data sets to see a longitudinal view of uh, the impairment of infrastructure at several levels. First of all, we, uh, we saw the data to see uh, the physical uh, <coughs> impairment, and then we also use other data sets to have a view of uh, the uh, uh, role, um, the, the, some networks, we used uh, RIPE Atlas also to detect uh, the uh, um, uh, worsening of infrastructure and some critical items. And then we used uh, RIPE Atlas and uh, MLAB to see the, how the uh, user's experience uh, uh, worsened. And that gave us a longitudinal perspective of at least 10 years of each of these levels where we want to see how the Venezuelan infrastructure worsened. So now, considering this context, um, we want to show the impact of the Venezuelan crisis in its internet infrastructure. Let me start with the submarine cables and uh, how they grew in the last 25 years in Venezuela. In this map, we see the cables that were built and uh, they started operating in Venezuela. What we see is that one single cable in the last 25 years was built and connected in Venezuela. This cable only connects Cuba. And this was absolutely designed to give internet to Cuba and not for the Venezuelans to benefit of the internet. So all this is strongly uh, the region 
Uh, in this, uh, during this, in this time, uh, the region led to a boom in commodities and a boom to the internet, uh, uh, and the submarine cables multiplied times five. And this is in sharp contrast with Venezuela, that also had a boom, but they saw no growth of the infrastructure of the submarine cables, as we see here. Another very important aspect that should be borne in mind is the peering facilities that are a key player in the, the physical infrastructure. Looking at this, uh, looking at peering DB, you see that the facilities went from zero to only four from 2018 to 2024. And this is in sharp contrast with the region where at present there are 600 peering facilities. Sorry. We don't get his voice. Si nosotros ahora If now we focus on if now we focus on the consequences of this poor connectivity, we're going to focus on the main uh, provider. The CAN TV was renationalized in, 20, in 2007, and uh, it's still the largest provider, 25% of the users. And as they declare it, they offer affordable services for the people. So now I want to focus on uh, what uh, this uh, uh, tells us. Uh, here in EXO, we have the time. Esteban, we, we are not hearing you. Uh, and now, uh, let me see. Yes. I don't know where you uh, lost me. I'm going to start the slide again. So what I want to show you with this slide is the connectivity of CAN TV that is the largest provider in Venezuela. CAN TV was renationalized by Chavez in 2007. It still serves the largest number of users, 25% of them. So now this provider is giving upstream transit to CAT TV. In blue, we have the providers registered in the United States, and the rest are in brown. It is here that CAN TV is renationalized. And what we can see is that in recent years, sorry, in red, the red bars, The U.S. providers disconnected from CAN TV. It's very difficult to know the causes, but it, partly it's because the insolvency of the uh, company. So. Something else, well, IXPs are other critical, inf part of the critical infrastructure that provide us connectivity. I know that all of you know what the IXPs are, but, well, we need, when uh, there are two local networks, a priori, they would use a long links and they would have to use uh, the public internet. But with, when the IXPs appears, these connectivities, this uh, connectivity is reduced, the prices go down, the latency goes down, and the IXPs permit the connectivity of the content. Uh, providers. So, and um, the IXPs are very popular around the world. So, we want to see how Venezuela relates with the IXPs. So, 
what we are going to see is the population of the IXPs, uh, the largest I, uh, the, the eyeballs and the eyes piece in uh, the region. So let me explain uh, this. In the X, uh, we have uh, the largest IXPs of each of the Latin American countries. And in the Y, we have all the countries in the region. What each cell uh, tells us, for instance, mine here is that 49.57 of the eyeballs in Chile are in ISPs directly connected to uh, the Chile in Santiago. So here, I want to see, we want to see what happens in Venezuela. And what we see is that there are no IXPs in Venezuela. There are only two countries in the region that I wanted to highlight that have no IXPs. One is Venezuela, and the other one is Uruguay. But the case of Uruguay and Venezuela is, is absolutely a contrast, because if we look at the upper part of the graph, we see that the Uruguayan networks are connected to other IXPs in the region. For instance, the one in Buenos Aires, in Santiago, or Sao Paulo. In the case of Venezuela, they're not connected to any of the large IXPs in the region. So we have no local IXPs or the benefit of uh, uh, IXPs in uh, the neighbor countries. Another aspect that we want to highlight is the role of the root DNS servers as an example of the quality of the Internet. There were two root DNS servers in Venezuela, L and F. L has one in uh, Maracaibo and another in Caracas, and F only in Caracas. But when we see the measurements that recurrently measure the accessibility of the root uh, uh, service, uh, we, we see that they are no longer operating. There used to be two in 2016, and now they are no longer accessible. And again, this uh, is in sharp contracts with the region with the expansion in the same period of the number of uh, root uh, service in Latin America multiplied by two. And countries like Chile and Brazil have multiplied the local instances. Uh, they have uh, doubled them. And Venezuela here at present has zero. Other DNS system that is very important for the quality of the internet is the Google Public DNS or a quad uh, eight. Well, in a 10-year period, we analyze the latency of the Venezuelans, and we see that the latency is very, very stable in 40 milliseconds. What we also see is that when analyzed uh, the Venezuelan case, case by case, we see that the users close to the border of Colombia and uh, have a smaller latency, probably because they benefit of the infrastructure in Colombia. Now, when we compare Venezuela with the rest of the region, we have major changes. LACNIC average is below 20 milliseconds, 20 percent lower than Venezuela. And we look at other countries, many have exceeded that barrier with latencies of 15 to 16 milliseconds. In the case of Venezuela, as you can see here, compared to other countries in the region, is way above that level. A further aspects that I don't need to explain in detail, because I'm sure that the community today is aware of, is the off-net deployment. When users generate content, they need to circulate and follow certain paths and through IXPs to have access to this content. One of the policies that has been frequently implemented is to deploy caches within the access networks where the content providers first fill these caches and then the users from the local networks can access to the services they have over here. So let's have a look at what is happening in Venezuela. And we see that there is a double component. When we look at Google and Akamai that deploy their infrastructure prior to this crisis in Venezuela back in 2013, we see that the amount of eyeballs that have access to these offnets is quite similar compared to other countries in the region, Argentina, Brazil, or Chile. Now, when we look at other networks such as Facebook, today Meta or Netflix that deploy the infrastructures in not so distant in time, we see that the values change quite considerably compared to other countries in the region. The most striking case is that of Netflix. Only in 2020, they start to provide off-net content in Venezuela. <coughs> Venezuela is over here, and Venezuela is over here. And finally, what I wanted to share with you with technical information is the bandwidth performance in Venezuela. What we note in this graph is that 
when we apply the speed test, the bandwidth was stagnant at one megabit per second for 10 years. This is in strong contrast with what happens in the rest of Latin America, which grew considerably over the same period. If we look at the values and we focus on this part, even if there has been growth in recent years in both graphs, the values are quite different. LACNIC has speeds in the entire region of 20 millibits per second, and Venezuela is three, about 10 to 15 percent the average speed in Latin America. However, we see this strong growth over here. You might ask me why, what is this due to? And this is because during the pandemic or after the pandemic, new high speed services were introduced in Venezuela. But unfortunately, these services cost 10 times the minimum salary and are not at all uh, available to the people in Venezuela. Although efforts have been made in Venezuela, when we compare Venezuela with the rest of the region, we note how. Venezuela is significantly behind compared to other countries in the region. So to close, allow me to speak about past, present, and future of critical infrastructure in Venezuela. The structure in infrastructure in Venezuela, as has been evident, has deteriorated at all levels. There have been new, new investments in infrastructure, such as with submarine cables, and as a result, there has been a deterioration in the network quality and connectivity, as well as a degradation in the user experience. So what can we do looking into the future? First is that there is a need to improve connectivity. All the relationships that were lost, I'm sure these can be reestablished very rapidly. We also speak about restarting pre-existing infrastructures like the root DNS services. If we can restart using these at once again, we can take advantage of this option. And finally, and the most difficult thing is to deploy new infrastructure. For example, public resolvers, Google could place resolvers there, or also submarine cables, which invires involves time and investment. So thank you very much, and I apologize for the technical inconveniences, and I'm happy to take any questions. I apologize for the audio issues. Uh, do we have any questions for Esteban? There are none in the room, but I have a question for you. Uh, you can answer in Spanish, feel free. What do you think are the most cost-effective initiatives to start the recovery of Venezuela's internet infrastructure? I will answer in Spanish. No se oye. Um, we have an audio issue here. I think the submarine cable infrastructure is there, and that in a scenario of improvement in the country, if there's a opportunity to recover these infrastructure, would provide better bandwidth and also would improve the other infra type of infrastructure that is deployed in the country. Hola, eu sou Douglas do Brasil. Hola. É, eu gostaria de saber se dentro dessa análise que você fez existe algum... I'm Douglas from Brazil, and I'd like to know whether there is space to look at the issue of satellite internet in Venezuela, because I can imagine that that is something that might occur outside that reality that you shared with us. Yes, satellite internet is a point and also a technology that is growing rapidly all over the world. There is anecdotal information on the use of Starlink, for example, in Venezuela. But when we looked at the Starlink data in Venezuela, we found no data having been reported for Venezuela. We do have technical limitations to understand this. But we are aware that there are many people in Venezuela who buy the Starlink dishes but they are registered in other countries. We still haven't found heuristics that can really reflect what is the contribution of Starlink and who is benefiting from this. What we are aware, 
And what we know from Starlink is that although there is a price difference across countries, this nevertheless is a very expensive service for the income of Venezuelans and for the reality of Venezuelans. If there are no more questions, please a round of applause for Esteban and thank you. Next presenting, uh, we have Cecilia Testart. Dr. Testart is an assistant professor at Georgia Tech. Her research field is at the intersection of internet measurements, network security, and public and administrative policies. Her work focuses on understanding how network operations use internet protocols, how to distinguish between attacks and configuration errors, and on how ecosystem initiatives impact internet operation. She will be presenting barriers to RPKI adoption. Cecilia, whenever you're ready. ready. Can you hear me? Yes. I can no longer see the room, but hopefully you can listen to me. We can hear you and we can see you as well. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share this with you. It's the first time I make a presentation in LACNIC. I was present in NANOG as well as in other network operators meetings, but this is the first time I make a presentation at LACNIC. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there in person, so I will tell you about myself so that you can understand where my research comes from. I am assistant professor in the United States, in a university based in Atlanta, and in the cybersecurity and privacy department and the computer sciences department. My field of research and my laboratory, which is called Internet for Society, is focused on internet measurements, network security, and how this can, in fact, report on internet policies and governance. My background is that I have a PhD in computer sciences from MIT, where I also did a master's in technology and policy. And prior to that, I also was in Europe, where I was trained at one of the engineering schools. But my undergrad is from Chile. I am an industrial engineering from the University of Chile, where I was born and grew up. So today, what I want to share with you is about, I want to speak about RPKI and research in this context, because I think this is one of the best steps you can take to improve routing security. Now, why routing security, why is routing security important? And not only because we firmly believe in this, but this is also of interest to the governments. I will be sharing some examples with you. I am based in the United States, and for me, it is such a technical topic and has, is present in regulations in the United States. This here is a document produced by the White House, which is the executive branch of the United States. This was published in March last year to improve cybersecurity in the United States. And here they quote that Many of the technical foundations of the digital ecosystem are inherently vulnerable. We must take steps. We lost the connection, I think, I'm afraid. So we must take steps to mitigate the most urgent of these pervasive concerns, such as the border gateway protocol vulnerabilities. I'm sorry, there's an issue with the connection. So the FCC starts to issue regulations so that the network operators in the United States improve their internet routing security. This is done through promoting RPKI. This is the most recent paper produced by the FCC. This was published in the month of June and has entered into force in August this year. This is very, very recent. So networks are required to have an RPKI adoption plan, the largest network networks in the United States not only have to have this plan, but every year they have to report this to the FSC and tell them 
what the status of their plan is and how they are improving in the adoption of RPKI. In addition to this, because the government realized that the adoption of RPKI is not only something that takes place through networks, and the FCC can only regulate the network operators, the White House has, as a result, issued a roadmap with steps stating how to improve network security and once again they insist on the relevance played by BGP and on the fact that all the organizations that have delegated IP space have to undertake efforts to register everything in BGP, in its of in RPKI. I also want to tell you that this is not only the case in the United States. This is an example from the government in the Netherlands. Last year, they issued a regulation stating that all the federal networks of the government for this year had to adopt RPKI. I cannot read this language, but this has been translated into English and showing what this regulation implies. Now, why is uh, such a great interest on in this? It occurs that this routing protocol, which we have been using since 1989, unfortunately has no mechanism that has been integrated to validate the information shared by the networks. So when the networks receive this information and then decide how to forward this information through the internet, it is impossible for the networks just using this protocol what information is correct and what information is not correct. The information might not be correct due to some error or also because it is an attack. And we have had very famous attacks that have hit the headlines. These are many of the reports that I always take note of when there is attacks or attacks such as these. As you can see, there are a large number of major enterprises, which are the ones that not only are the ones that have the largest amount of resources, but attract the largest amount of talents. And the problem is so complex, uh, and uh, it uh, it's. Uh, uh, impossible to apply to all uh, the uh, um, in it's all in the internet. So even uh, uh, cloud, fair horizon, uh, Verizon, and all, all the governments can't escape the vulnerabilities that this protocol opens. So that what you can see here, that we've seen problems hijacking. Well, there is uh, theft uh, of a. Uh, um, uh, <clears throat> there have been uh, a lot of uh, of uh, uh, thefts uh, of. Uh, um, uh, com cryptocurrency and confidential information traffic that should be local in a country and that leaves the country and go comes back. Uh, there are big geopolitical problems, and in the case here in the United States, repeatedly, when now uh, we see that the attacks come from China and Russia, and also creating events, um, as an event uh, that was happened in uh, July through a BGP problem. It. Uh, much of the internet was not accessible because the DNS of Cloudflare was not working because of a, a bug. So we um, there is a, a conviction that uh, the security of BGP needs to be done, and uh, that is done through the RPKI. So the resource of um, the public uh, key infrastructure, and uh, this is. Uh, security framework that was designed uh, to uh, improve the safety, the security of routing, to have a, a, a cryptographic certificate that links uh, the IP uh, to the number of uh, the uh, um, IP. So it is in this framework that uh, to uh, the uh, the original registries are the the networks are given the keys that they can use uh, to um, to link to uh, the certificate to to link that to uh, to show the origin of the IP fixes. So RPKI has two sides. On the one hand, the networks need to register the so-called route the row are row row us um, and it's a a cryptographic certification that links the IP to the origin of the network. So here, a network would have, for instance, uh, the prefix uh, uh, 18.00/16, and uh, the 
origin can be certified through a cryptographic signature because the signature is verified even reaching with uh, the regional um, the RIR. So that ensures that that is what the network, that, that is how the network wants the prefix to be originated in BGP and the second side of uh, RPKI and that uh, the networks can have access to and uh, download all these certificates and validating them and with that valid information when it, um, they can, for instance, to receive a message the, the, where they have information that is registered in their PKI and they verify it. And in this case, the origin is not the origin of the certificate. So the routers, as they connect with this information, they can filter and not use uh, that information. And when the correct information gets there, the routers use that information and those they make those uh, uh, routes available to send the data. So BGP or RPKI has two, these two sides. First of all, the networks have to register these cryptographic registries, and then, then they can use them. So this research paper in this presentation, I focus on the first part, because if the networks fail to register the prefix and IP in RPKI, and they do not register their certificates even, if they are doing the second space, they are not protected. So it is very important for RPKI to reach as close as possible to 100% adoption when registering the IP addresses in RPKI. And that depends really on the regional, uh, the RIRs. And you see here that they are five so RPKI has five that are called roots of trust. Those are the ones that have the first key generated so that afterwards you can build the cryptographic tree. And you see that LACNIC plays a role so that all the area of LACNIC may have access to um, such our certificates. So what we did in this research is we realized that RPKI has uh, had a great level of adoption. Now 50% of uh, the prefixes announced in BGP are uh, registered in RPKI, but that means that the remaining 50% are not. And RPKI was standardized in 2012, so over 12 years ago. So um, our question is, why is it that there are networks that have not adopted uh, RPKI? What's happening? And given the uh, relevance of the improvement of the internet, how can tools be designed to support the networks as they adopt uh, RPKI? And this uh, research, we conducted it uh, using all the public data through uh, um, uh, route views and RIPE NCC of the announcements of uh, and uh, also using the uh, RPKI cryptographic trees that are published by the different RIRs, and also seeing the uh, uh, geolocation of the Internet uh, Health Report, the Initiative Japan. So, just to tell you very quickly, the greatest conclusions of our research is that we identified four factors that really have an impact on the adoption of RPKI geography. The area when organization stands uh, really has an impact on the level of adoption, the size of uh, the network, the category, and the type. Uh, um, is this an, uh, it's whether it's an ISP or a government network or a network of a, some uh, organization. And we also realize that the complexity of the delegation of the IP addresses that uh, are used by the network also have an impact on the level of adoption. And here I'm going to show you how we reach these conclusions. This In this chart, what I'm showing is the level of adoption of RPKI and uh, the amount of uh, IP space that is protected by RPKI by the different RIRs. And as you can see here, um, well, here you have, you see Europe and uh, Middle East. LACNIC is doing quite well. 
um, is under RIPE, and the other IRRs are still lower. However, we can see that there's a lot of potential growth because LACNIC just uh, barely uh, surpassed uh, 50 percent. Now, that is uh, based on uh, the area of uh, the RIRs that are quite large. Now, let's see it uh, by country where we geolocalize the prefixes to a country where they are being used. And you see that in the five different areas of RIRs, there's a high difference, even within countries. And you see that at LACNIC, although most countries have quite a high level of adoption, Brazil is remarkably lower than the rest of LACNIC. The other thing that you see is that there are really countries that have a very high level of adoption, specifically here in the Middle East. Many countries have a 90 percent adoption or over. So we, when we saw that such a high uh, adoption, we wondered how can how do they succeed to have such a high adoption, and what led them to that? Our hypothesis. Well, first of all, in the RIPE area, where most countries have over 50 percent adoption of our PKI, and we really believe that this is because of the community of RIPE, the efforts by the RIPE community. Because if you compare the training, information, education, possibilities and workshops discussing our PKI, how to use it, and the tools that were developed for uh, managing the RPKI resources, really, RIPE has done a lot, a lot of effort. They are uh, very closely connected with the community uh, to discuss that. And then afterwards, when we, s we we wondered how is it that unexpectedly some countries had a very high adoption of RPKI, one of our hypotheses is that these are countries where there's a lot of concentrate in the network operators in the market. Although sometimes that is not good for several reasons, actually it makes life easier from the security perspective because if there are three big networks and the three of them adopt RPKI, then most of the country is covered with uh, so. And the other thing that it showed was uh, that uh, um, um, most uh, countries have, well. In LACNIC, most of the countries had 60 percent adoption. I want to congratulate you for seeing uh, all the resources made available by LACNIC and all the efforts uh, trying to convince everybody to read, to um, adopt uh, RPKI. That is possibly the reason why LACNIC is doing so well. Now, geography has no impact. Uh, and here we see that uh, always when we do it, uh, when we see it globally, the networks of a lower of smaller sizes are clearly uh, lagging behind in the adoption so at a global level there's a difference like 10 percent and although the larger networks are in 40 percent adoption the smaller ones are 30 percent and and i want to show you specifically what happens with lacnic you see that lacnic is doing well, but the smaller networks are considerably lagging considerably behind than the largest networks at LACNIC. And our hypothesis here, both for LACNIC and this can be uh, applied to elsewhere, is that uh, for smaller networks, it's more expensive to apply uh, RPKI. It's, it's uh, because of the cost of human resources and the time is that the operators will have to devote to this is more complex. And if they are smaller networks, there you don't have so many incentives for adopting RPKI. And very often, what I frequently see in the United States with this network, for instance, uh, they, these are occasional, sometimes they are small institutes, learning uh, education uh, uh, centers, and they don't even know how RPKI works or where they can draw resources from, especially, for instance, if these are institutions that uh, received an uh, IP delegation a long time ago. Maybe from an organization point of view, it may be very complex for them to, to show evidence of the IP delegation. So as a result of that, smaller networks may find it more difficult to adopt RPKI. But in addition to size, 
what we we also see the um, different sectors because although the network operators are the ones that participate in this uh, these events they are not the only ones present in the internet and when we see the networks of the autonomous system numbers the ASNs the number and the routers that they use well the BGP, uh, they, those are not necessarily network operators they may be corporate government education um, and although it is very difficult to achieve indeed uh, end-to-end -end internet, it is very difficult to know what type of uh, network it is, because in B2B you only see the number and uh, mapping the number and the organization, and then with the type of organization, that's very difficult. And by using two data sets that uh, are in the internet, in the types of uh, networks, well, we see the, the, the data sets are um, agree, and uh, clearly we see a difference in the adoption of RPKI. We see that those that are closer to networks that offer internet services, including the network operators, either uh, home or satellite, or that offer things such as uh, cloud hosting, or to maintain servers connected to the to the network, they have a great uh, adoption rate than uh, the networks whose uh, main. Ah, uh, service is not uh, the provision of internet, such as education networks and government networks. And obviously, these networks, and, and I refer to those that do not offer internet services, they have small networks if you compare them against the rest of the internet operators. And being small, they have the difficulties proper to those small networks with limited resources, very small teams, and the greatest function is to maintain connectivity in the network. And now, among their roles, um, uh, security is being added, but uh, typically their um, aim was uh, to maintain connectivity and handle the data within the organization, and now they have to add security as one uh, other role. Additionally, from the standpoint of the economic incentives, when networks don't offer internet services, they don't have that much incentives to adopt RPKI, for example, these networks don't have users that might select another network and say, well, I prefer, uh, I'm worried about my security. I'm going to select a network that also takes care of security and has adopted RPKI because these users are inflexible in terms of demand. The government will use these nevertheless. And if it's an educational institute, students will nevertheless use this. They don't have options to go to another network. So that lack of flexibility uh, and the economic incentive in these cases is not present compared to those networks that offer internet services. And finally, I wanted to finish referring to the complexity of adopting RPKI for certain IP spices where they have a very complex delegation. This is something that we managed to understand looking at the RPKI adoption through the major internet networks. These are the tier one networks. This graph shows the increase in the adoption of RPKI for a set of the major networks of the tier one. You see some lines have increased gradually and others have a peak where they very rapidly go from very low adoption to very high adoption. So when we look at the performance, we tried to figure out what was happening. It occurred that these major networks have quite a lot of differences as to how the IP addresses has been delegated. The networks that advance at a slower pace are those that have ISP space and have sub-delegation. So this is their own IP space, but this IP space was delegated to other networks and these two other networks in turn. And considering how RPKI works, these networks cannot register a certificate for one of the largest prefixes they use. If one has an RPKI certificate for a slash eight, that is a very big space for internet prefixes, and it is likely that they have many delegations in between. And the way RPKI work is that if the slash A has a certificate, that forces that all those that are 
below that delegation have to have a certificate or the internet routes will be considered invalid or the BGP routes. This can lead to connectivity problems for users of those networks. Quite obviously, they are the clients of that network. And those networks, the way they maintain themselves is because these pay, clients pay per traffic. So if these networks registered these certificates for these larger prefixes, they would have they, this would be um, harmful for them in terms of income, in addition to leading to internet interruptions for the smaller networks who are their clients. And quite obviously, they won't do so. And this is what we note over here that other networks that have made only slow progress. We see how they cover small segments of the network as time goes by. So it is likely that there will be prioritization in those networks as to which is the space that will be adopting this uh, little by little. But this takes time. It takes time to coordinate things with the smaller networks or with those that have subdelegations in order to register the RPKI certificates. This slide repeats what we understood in that graph. In other words, the networks that have more complex delegations or subdelegations find it more difficult to adopt RPKI and require longer because this involves coordinating things with other networks in order to avoid internet interruptions. To conclude, what we realize is that the smaller networks need more support in order to use RPKI. In addition to this, local efforts of the communities have borne fruit, and it would be great if they would receive even further support. And at least in the United States, the government is recognizing the role of having of these networks and trying to encourage workshops and more events in order to increase education on RPKI and the relevance of RPKI. In addition to this, the networks don't offer internet services require specific support. One, because of the incentives, and secondly, because all these countries that have these regulations that encourage the adoption of RPKI, these networks will be left outside because the regulations are done sector by sector. So these networks that are not internet operators and are not normally considered in the regulations, will therefore have to go through channels to the sectors. For example, for different types of industries, and this has to be a more local effort that is more generic than network operators. Additionally, coordination through the ecosystem is essential, and one of the ideas we have is that although networks that don't offer internet services are not directly considered in this regulation and it is more difficult for them, these networks tend to be clients of major networks. So major networks can play a significant role in assisting the smaller networks or those networks that are not operators but have IP addresses so that they can register their IPs in RPKI. So I will stop here because my idea and my vision is that we should try to achieve 100 percent as far as possible. And I think the region would, it would be very positive if the region adopts more RPKI, particularly with a focus on the smaller networks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cecilia. Unfortunately, we are a bit late uh, with this uh, talk, so we are going to skip the questions this time. But thank you very much again for, for your presentation, Cecilia. And we are going to go uh, directly to the next presenter. And uh, the next presenter is Amrish Fukia. Uh, he is also remote, and uh, 
Dr. Fukia is currently serving as the Internet Measurement Data Expert uh, at the Internet Society. His research interests are in the area of computer network security and telecommunication policy, with an emphasis on Internet measurement, in which Amrish has made a significant contribution. In the past years, he also played a key role in designing tools to study the global health of the Internet. Uh, he is presenting today a view of the content locality in South America. Amrish, the stage is yours virtually. Thank you, Massimo. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation. I wish I could be on site, but uh, uh, it's still a pleasure for me to present uh, remotely. And uh, it's my uh, second time I think I'm presenting to the LACNIC community. Uh, and I, I, I look forward that uh, this uh, presentation is in, interesting uh, for you. So let me quickly share my screen. Right. So, yeah, today uh, the topic of our talk is about content locality. So, as you know, content is very important on the internet because this is what everyone um, uh, needs access to. And uh, where the content is located is actually uh, quite important. So, before I start, uh, who am I? Uh, Massimo gave a, uh, a nice introduction. I joined the Internet Society in 2021. I work there as an internet measurement and data expert, and I'm currently leading the measuring the internet project in which we have an important tool called the uh, Internet Society Pulse, which is a dashboard that collects data about the health of the internet. And it is part of this uh, uh, initiative, uh, the Pulse initiative that we are also conducting this study. Before joining the Internet Society, I was a research manager at Afrinic, where I worked a lot on uh, DNSSEC or our PKI, uh, and I'm also involved in the academic community uh, whenever I can. I mentioned about the, our Pulse dashboard, so if you have a chance, please have a look at uh, pulse.internetsociety.org. You will see there we curate data from different places and we try to present it in a very easy and uh, uh, easy way for you to uh, to use that information. And it is it is especially meant for uh, policymakers. Uh, so that it is easy for them to um, use in the information in the advocacy work. So um, today the talk is about local content. So usually we tend to say that local is better, uh, similarly as you have uh, locally produced foods. Uh, why is local better? Because there are different benefits. The first of all, economic benefits. Uh, when you are consuming, let's say, local food, you are, it's cheaper, usually cheaper. You're supporting the, the local community and here as well. When you are consuming local content, you're also supporting the local ISPs, the local content providers, and uh, those who are also providing infrastructure. So there is a, a cost benefit as well. Um, a, for content, for example, you will save a lot on international links, and you will also free up the bandwidth for usage for different other things. There is also a lot of gain in terms of quality and performance, uh, you would agree. A higher internet speed, a higher reliability, and also in, an improved user experience because the content is just closer to, to the end user. And also security benefits. Some countries might like that the data, let's say, on for their banks or, or, or other types of data are in the local jurisdiction for security purposes. And then, of course, when you're when you're consuming local, you're also uh, building the community and enhancing the the, the capacity of, of the local community. So there are different benefits. Um, at the Internet Society, we have a project called the 5050 Vision, where we want, uh, in some specific economies around the world, for them to have at least 50% of the most visited or the, the most popular content to be local, so that they reduce their dependency on uh, expensive international links. So it is within this framework that we have developed this uh, measurement work, and uh, I will show you some results. First of all, the methodology. Well, we 
before diving into the methodology, I will just give you a little bit of uh, definitions that uh, that's uh, in, in, within the project. So what is local traffic? Local traffic is content that is sourced locally from an in-country server. So it doesn't need to be uh, content which is locally produced, but at least it is sourced and it is located uh, in-country. This is what we call local traffic. External traffic is, also, of course, when you try to access a uh, content which is found in an another country. Then, of course, you have different types of uh, delivery mechanisms. You have CDNs, so content delivery networks, which are operators that place their uh, servers uh, in different places, whether it is at the at an internet exchange point or at the, in the network of an ISP. And then you have also content caches and other types of uh, edge networks. So, of course, there are different ways for us to, to get what are the most used or what, what are the most popular content um, that, are, that people are consuming. You have uh, the case where you can take traffic volume, for example, and, and look at, for example, at, at an ISP where most of the traffic are going. Uh, but usually this information is very uh, hard to get. Uh, so we decided to instead use a proxy. So we are using the top 1,000 websites by country and Google Crux, uh, if you're familiar with that. So uh, Google um, Chrome is actually collecting information on uh, which websites people are visiting and they are and, and, and putting this information uh, uh, publicly available for, for researchers. So using Google Crux, you are able now to, um, to, to know which are the most visited websites in the country. Then we obviously need to, to run the measurements from a local standpoint. So usually you have different types of uh, frameworks that would allow you to, to run measurements. The uh, RIPE Atlas is one. Um, but uh, in our case, we had to run HTTP measurements. So we had to have access to the website itself. And RIPE, as you know, does it allow you to run HTTP uh, queries on, on random websites. So we use something else called residential proxies. It works in a very similar way as VPNs. So just as you would have VPN endpoints in different places in the world, you would have also residential proxies, or it could be data center proxies or different types of proxies that are placed in, in different places around the world. So using that proxies, and the good thing is that they have a quite good coverage, we are able to run the measurements. So first of all, before running the HTTP query, one thing that we had to do is determine where are those 1,000 websites hosted. So as you know, there are different ways of hosting websites. You could either uh, use one of those different CDN providers, as you can see on the screen, or you can say, oh, I will host my website natively uh, myself on my own server. So there are basically two ways to do that. And so we run an exercise to extract whether a website is hosted by a CDN or by or, or native. Then uh, this is where now we run our study using the residential proxies. So what we do, we do not run actually the measurement to the 1,000 websites because that would be too many. We only run them to, let's say, Cloudflare or uh, Akamai or Microsoft to the to the hosters of those uh, 1,000 websites. So the idea is actually to determine whether one of those big, one of those CDNs or, or cash providers are actually located in that country. Then we would know that 10 or 50 or 500 websites using that CDN is located in that country. We also merge in, in our uh, methodology some information about market share because then we use that market share information to weigh uh, our calculations. We are, then we also do geolocation. So our geolocation process is in two phases. So there is the first phase where all the websites that are, that are hosted natively, so without a CDN, we geolocate them. And, and, and again, we try to geolocate them from a local vantage point so that we get as much as possible uh, some accurate information on geolocation. Then our next step is geolocating 
the CDN caches. So how do you do that? The good thing about CDNs is that they provide what we call geo hints. So for example, if I'm in South Africa and I'm trying to access uh, a content on Cloudflare, it will return uh, some geo hints in the HTTP response. So for example, it's a Cloudflare, CFRA, GNB, and GNB stands for Johannesburg. This is how I know that when I'm trying to access content from South Africa, I'm hitting a local cache. For example, in that case, Johannesburg. So using this data now, uh, we will do that on all CDNs that we have identified. And also on the, on the other side, we will also do the geolocation on the natively hosted websites. And then put together, as I said, we, we weigh that by the ASN market share. And then we get a weighted value of uh, how many, what's the percentage of local, regional, and external uh, hosting. So generally, so if we take all uh, the unique 1,000 websites per country, we get around, let's say, 85,000 websites. And if we have to classify them into whether they are hosted by CDN or natively, it's 60% CDN and 40% native. Around the world, it's like, it's like that. So this gives us a good indication about how much of how much CDN usage we have around the world. And which CDN is the most popular? So if we take all the websites for, let's say, 170 countries, which CDN is the most used? And uh, without a surprise here, we see Cloudflare, which is quite heavily used, followed by Akamai and Cloud. So now this is showing us the, the, the rate of content locality around the world. The dark head is, it means there's a high rate of content locality. And uh, uh, the less dark it is, it means that those countries fetch their content in other regions, in out of, out of the country, basically. So if you have a look at, um, at Latin America, for example, you see that Brazil is quite leading in the game. Yeah. I'll give a little bit more detail about the different countries later on. Um, who is leading in terms of locality by region? Uh, it seems that Asia and Europe are doing quite well, followed by the Americas and, and Oceania, and Africa is a little bit lag, lagging behind. And uh, if we need to uh, rank the CDN providers or the content providers now uh, in terms of whether they are local or not, we see that Akamai has quite a good footprint around the world, followed by Facebook and Cloudflare. This doesn't come with much surprise because we know those uh, content providers are quite well distributed around the world, especially Cloudflare with their AnyCar servers and their Quad1 um, service, for example. So this is the data that we have for, for some um, South American countries. Uh, as you can see in blue is how much the how much content is being fetched from a local cache or server. Green is regional and white is external. So Argentina here is right on the 50% mark. Uh, Brazil and, and Chile has passed the 50% mark and they are around maybe 60 or even 70. So there's a bit of a mix and match in uh, Southern America, uh, yeah, Southern American countries. Uh, with some leaders and, 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 and some followers, and some countries are actually doing quite good. And this might be correlated to the ecosystem in the country, uh, for example, the presence of uh, uh, IXPs and uh, data centers, which are actually helping to create a quite uh, dynamic environment to uh, allow content hosting locally. So more results. So this is, for example, Paraguay. Um, now we are looking at, um, uh, so the size of the bars are basically the number of websites we are looking here. And on the left, you have the content providers. And on the right, you, you have where they are located. So most of the natively hosted websites, they are, they are the here are external. Uh, Cloudflare is, uh, I would say, half-half local and, and regional. Amazon is external, for example, and Akamai is, is local. So yeah, you, you have uh, this information uh, that maybe operators uh, or even policymakers in, 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 in Paraguay can use to actually say, oh, maybe we need 
you do a little bit more in terms of attracting some of those uh, players in, in to, to put their cash in the local ecosystem. This is for Suriname, where um, uh, interestingly, Cloudflare is, is is local there, so it means that users accessing websites that are hosted by Cloudflare most likely they will hit a local cache. Um, most of the natively hosted websites are external. Uh, Akama is local, and Amazon is also external. So uh, this is for Guyana. Uh, Cloudflare is local. Uh, others are, are external, and Amazon is also external. And finally, Uruguay. Um, so the content which is the, the, the websites which are hosted look uh, natively, half of it is externally hosted and half of it is locally hosted, which means there, there, there are some, uh, probably some hosting facilities that people are using within the country itself. Um, Cloudflare um, is hitting, was hitting uh, in Uruguay a regional cache rather than a local cache. But this can also be, uh, for example, if uh, the, the Cloudflare cache in the country at the, at the point of measurement was redirected because of, let's say, it's not operational, usually they will redirect the traffic to some regional cache. So uh, it may happen that during, during the time of our measurement, we are hitting a regional cache rather than a local cache as well. Uh, so this is a work which is in progress. So we want to expand our methodology and do some more uh, testing. So for example, trying to see whether we can find an IXP on the path between the user and the content. And uh, obviously we are planning to um, uh, send this uh, work um, in, an, in an academic conference eventually. Uh, but, but part of this work was already published at the ANRW at the IRTF uh, in this July. And we have incorporated the data on the Plus platform. So if you want to go and see how much or how, how much traffic is or content is local for your country, you can go on the country report section on the Internet Society Post. Uh, this research is being um, so we have a, a fellowship program at the Internet Society, and we had a fellow, uh, James from if from the UK, that the worked on this project, and it is a project that is sponsored by Meta. With this, I think I have finished my presentation. would like to thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amrish. Um, we have a question for you, if you can be um, brief about it. Uh, about the hyperscaler he hegemony, is it a good or bad, a bad thing that hyperscalers are everywhere? What about small local cloud providers? Where is their place in the ecosystem? Good question. And uh, in in some in some countries of the world, uh, for example, where because of the economic situation, for example, sanctions, some of those high pay scalers cannot place themselves in those countries. And what we have found interestingly is that there is a more vivid um, ecosystem of local players. So it forces them to, to have local players to uh, actually create local clouds and actually use those local clouds to, actually, to, to, to serve content. So I think this is a good example of how perhaps people can break away from uh, the hegemony of uh, uh, hyperscalers because uh, it will also help the local community to grow and to provide those as well. Thank you very much, Amrish. <laughs> so next we have our last presenter for the session, Enrique Gonzalez. He is an expert in digital connectivity evaluation and co-founder of EFTS Group. He's a communications and electronics engineer from the Instituto Politécnico Nacional de México and has an MBA from the Instituto Tecnológico de Estudios Superiores de Monterrey. Enrique has over 25 years of experience in the telecommunications sectors. He will be presenting municipal connectivity score based on bulk internet measurement data.
todos. Muchas gracias. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank LACNIG and LACNAG for giving me this opportunity. This is the last presentation, so let's go to the point directly. Today, I'm going to tell you about a paper, the work that we developed in the last five years as we discussed with the different stakeholders for the improvement of the Internet in Latin America. I'm speaking of regulators and operators, and uh, governments, uh, development uh, banks. And as a conclusion, we found a similarity that we might say that is uh, quite a frequent uh, question among these different uh, stakeholders. And it is that we needed a point of departure to be able to show in a simple and clear way how to evaluate and especially how to communicate about the state of the digital um, uh, connectivity in the different territories. It's absolutely relevant to acknowledge that uh, the granularity with which uh, the um, evaluation uh, um, results are given depend on who is the target audience. So, so for a regulator, maybe the national level is Im important or the state level, but for a, a specific state, it may be more relevant to analyze the municipal data. But when you go, we go to the ISPs that are the ones that uh, take service and all the technical issues of the network, we need more granularity in the data. And it is there that we saw that uh, our pers uh, perspective and analysis evolved. So what uh, is proposed to solve this first uh, issue? Well, the uh, was to create a municipal score that could give us uh, user-friendly mapping and visualization so that little by little we could start seeing the technical details. And to that end, we created this score that goes from 0 to 100, evaluating each municipality in a country. We, here we see Jalisco, where we have Tequila Jalisco, Mexico. And after that, we uh, categorize it further to give an immediate value of perception from uh, excellent, outstanding to extremely poor. So we evaluated both fixed and uh, mobile networks. And the perspectives of analysis are coverage, of course, but not just coverage. Well, for instance, in uh, the clearest dimension is the population, but also territorial, the territory that requires connectivity. Very often we forget that the situation in Latin America speaks about covered population. But if we were fo to focus where that population is located, we would be forgetting the stadiums, the roads, the industrial facilities. So in terms of coverage, we assess the population as well as a ter territory that has the need of for Internet services. We also focused on quality. Today, we're using the three factors, speed for upload and download, latency, and on occasions, we also apply DDoS. So the final situation is the number of options that an end user has to hire a service, whether through mobile or fixed networks, in order to see what the competition is in that market. This is a portal containing very important information. This is publicly available information for Mexico. Here I am applying a filter to share with you the results of what we consider is the scale, the good scale. We have 500 municipalities in Mexico and 200 municipalities are considered receive a score of good. Excellent is smaller. They have a smaller percentage. Then we have other options as to where this is considered acceptable, where the inferior part is, the lower part, and 
This is due to several reasons. From the center to the north of the country, we have many extensive areas with low population density, but focused in the cities, but towards the south of the country. This is where we have the main problems, both in the south and in the north. We have large areas of the territory. In the north, we have deserts, and in the south, we have mountains and jungle. So this is the information we have publicly available. Very recently, we completed this study for Brazil. This information is not yet publicly available. We are reviewing this information, but the intention is to cover as many countries as possible in Latin America. Bueno, eso fue nuestro punto de so that was a starting point. Now, where are we heading? In what direction are we going to evolve? Initially, the idea was to provide clear and rapid information so as to have an initial diagnosis. But as the intention is to evolve as to where connectivity is needed and to consider what is the required investment to improve this connectivity. This is because there might be connectivity available or there can be no connectivity available. But if available, to assess where that connectivity is located and what is the quality in order to determine whether it's insufficient in terms of quality and coverage. So to answer to these three, these three questions, first, we had to provide information, provide relevant information, in other words, that this is really actionable information. Actionable because this is precise information, because it is updated every quarter. We update the results in terms of connectivity supply. And also because this information should be complete in terms of the access, and also because we can produce this in a timely way. At the end of every quarter, we dedicate a couple of weeks to this task. Now that the process has become automated, there are large data volumes that we process, and this allows us to deliver within two to three weeks these results. So this information is available to do intra-municipal studies. This allows us then to determine the strategic planning to improve connectivity. And this should be useful in each of the stages in terms of improving digital connectivity. But most of all, this is essential for the diagnosis as well as for the follow-up of this impact. So to sum up, what we seek to do is to contribute input to have public policies. We're also working for private investments. And a further point are the public-private partnerships. So we can measure the social impact achieved through these initiatives aimed at maximizing the benefit. I will now show you a specific case of what I'm referring to. This is a more comprehensive portal that we are using for the purpose of the analysis. This is a photograph of my country in terms of, as I was saying, where you have the scores, the outstanding communication, and poor communication. We recently were have the pleasure of collaborating with ITSI, the IXP from Yucatan. And these are the results for the state of Yucatan, which most of you know. And this is an example that might show that there is no problem in Merida. Merida is the capital city of Yucatan. And very specifically, I'd like to refer to the case of Merida. I'll go back one slide first. 
and show you. On the right, we have the global results for our country. 126 million inhabitants in Mexico. We saw that 7% of the population does not live where there is an opportunity to have access to fixed networks. In the case of mobile networks, this is only 4.3%. The number of households is quite similar. This is the distribution. And in terms of economic units, this is businesses. This is like a convenience store on the corner to a major corporation. The divide in terms of coverage could be non-existent. So what we're referring to is expressed in percentages, but there are 45,000 businesses that don't have access to the internet through fixed networks. Now let us go back to the other slide. This is Merida, Merida. And in fact, this is Yucatan as a whole. It has good numbers. It's not performing that badly. And I selected Oaxaca, otros lugares. Yucatan and not other cases such as Oaxaca, because I want to highlight that this is a situation in which connectivity such as uh, in terms of access or the divide in terms of access shows a trend where there are other divides that occur, and not only in terms of access. These are the numbers for Yucatan. And these here are the municipalities in Yucatan. And you see the performance here in blue. We have the municipalities with the top and the bottom scores. And this is the average in blue. We have Merida. Merida has an almost 100% coverage in terms of competition. More than four operators offer service in one municipality, but this starts to have a quality issue. So this is the distribution of Merida's population. This information has been obtained from satellite images because in many places in Latin America, we don't have sufficient information to determine the location of inhabitants and households. This is mobile coverage. In other words, this includes the entire population. Then fixed networks, and we also have quality. You see how the southern part and the northern part and the western part of the city have a normal courage, but this city has been growing significantly in terms of industry and population that is migrating to this city. These are the operators, and we see the same situation towards the south. There is an operator, there is an ISP that is a niche ISP, it is a small ISP that shares its service. Somewhere we have the historically dominant provider, but analyses such as these become can become actionable information and of major strategic value to consider a deployment. Here we see the zone where we have the poorest quality in a very specific area where there is growth that is taking place, and the niche operator provides far better quality of service. So this is how we can make a contribution to strategic planning in order to improve the networks. So this is not only on the information provided to the governments, but also for the ISPs. A couple of references as to from where the conceptualization of the score is obtained from. This is a practical application of a compound geographical index. This is very recent. This was done in the month of May this year. This was published by the ITU. These are mapping and visualization strategies for the assessment of connectivity. We participated in this 
activities. And over here, these are the three dimensions that we evaluated for fixed and mobile networks. This is broken down into 12 indicators. We can therefore evaluate this based from these three standpoints. Initially, we spoke about stating that this is a score based on enormous volumes of data. We are evaluating about 15 million daily measurements through crowdsourcing in two ways. One is access to information that is enabled by the user or also collected in the background. So 15 million daily measurements over one year to conduct this analysis. 60 million was the number of daily collected data for Brazil. Here I'm referring to the connectivity demand. This encompasses all the type of data, public, private, by the home, in order to identify these basic areas for the analysis or the hexagons that we saw in an intra-municipal analysis. And to finish my presentation, as you already heard in this great event, Digital inclusion goes beyond access, although at this moment we believe that we are assessing things in a comprehensive way and that there are always opportunities for improvement. The path forward goes beyond this. It has to do with affordability, it has to do with digital skills until we reach the concept of significant connectivity in order to be providing access to more people to digital opportunities. This is the objective we are all aiming at. We are at this stage. We have done affordability measurements. We are now considering a collaboration to see how we can assess these skills. So my last slide has precisely to do with this concept. I think we are one at the very best forums to collaborate. This is the first time that we have an opportunity to be here. I have met very talented people. And I think that with the new partnerships and contacts that we have established, we'll be able to improve things in order to better analyze and follow up the digital connectivity in our countries. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you, Enrique, for your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, are already uh, uh, late. We are going to skip questions, but uh, you can talk to Enrique. Uh, so we are uh, going to close immediately. Uh, if you can show the slides just